Let me tell you a story. So many, 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 many years ago, my very first year serving here at, at Leadership Lab, I was on staff for Advanced Lab. And um, the entire Advanced Lab fit in the lobby of Erickson Dorm. And we would gather together for the beginning of our, our uh, lab sessions and then we would break into our small groups. I think there might have been five. And uh, we, went, we just went to different corners of the space and did our things there. And I had this, uh, this short kid. He was really... He was alright. I mean, he was very friendly. A little odd, but a lot of you are. <laughs> and, uh, and I and uh, we had an awesome group. They, they just every opportunity they just had. Uh, they climbed down and, and, and shared. Uh, we grew together all through the through the week. It was a it was a wonderful wonderful week, and it was uh, a wonderful first week uh, for me to be at leadership lab. And um, so ask me if I've ever seen that 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 kid. I have. I saw him. Um, I saw him a few years later when he was um, he was coming back, right? And uh, now we we, were, we weren't sure that he would amount to much. At one point, he was selling shoes, um, which is I mean, it's a fine thing to do, selling shoes. But we all kind of knew that he had like he had some other things that um, he should be doing besides selling shoes. You know what I'm saying? Selling shoes is good, but but you know maybe there's other things for him. And it turns out. Um, he uh, he found his way, you know, to seminary and and then back to leadership lab. And he's had a few roles here, and we thought we'd let him say a few things to us. Do you know what his name is? Ask me what his name is. Okay. His name is Ben Bergren. <laughs> he's still a little odd, but I like him a lot. I like you too. They only let us hang out for once, one week a year because, well, it wouldn't be so good if we were here together. For much you, you, you know, uh, one of the nice, let's reminisce. One of the nicest things we ever saw to me, and this is back when I was a teenager, so maybe like step fourth year, you said to me, because Kelly, your daughter, was, a, was younger at that point, and she still was. <laughs> and you said to me, I really hope that I have the kind of relationship with Kelly that you have with your dad. See, my dad used to be on the staff as well. He said, I hope I have the kind of relationship that you have with your dad. And I've never forgotten that. And I know you do. And that, and that is amazing. So let me start out with a question for you. Has your life changed because of this week? Yeah. Yeah? Let me ask another question. Have you got a glimpse of God here this week? Have you felt the presence of God in your life here this week? tell you in two places for me. One is just being in communion. Because God is in and around that. But the other place has been here in worship with the band. And, and here's something you, I mean you guys know the band is great, right? Yep. Here's something you probably don't know. They're as good, if not better, than pretty much any other worship band in the Lutheran Church. Period. Period. When you get around and you get to hear other groups, pretty much now you're going to be like, oh, we should let them is better. Right? So we're blessed to have them come and be a part of us. Now, now that aside, a uh, couple of other things. You know, we are streaming online. We've streamed worship all week. And there are people all over watching. And, and so just give me a second. Uh, 
Rach, I'll be home tomorrow at 4.30. Don't forget to pick me up. <laughs> because I really don't want to have to take a cab home from, from the airport. So don't mark your calendar at 4.30. I will be home and looking forward to seeing you. So, first step. Well, it's kind of like FaceTime, right? It's like, like it's one-way FaceTime. And, and, then, and then also, I know for a fact that somebody I went to Leadership Lab with is watching right now, which is kind of cool. And then, I don't know if he's watching, but Pastor Tom Jenkins, if you're watching, you can get your butt back in that. So when I'm at home, one of the things we like to do in the evening is we like to take walks because I live in the National Park, and if you see my name up there, below that, no, oh yeah, stay there. That is looking out from the front of my house. And we love to take Show walks. Up. What is that? Nothing. <laughs> Please hold this nine comments until the end. Thank you. And we have this route we like to take, which is a little bit over two miles long. And the thing is, is it's, it's really easy because there's only one hill at the very end back to the house. And when it comes to walking, let's, let's flip over. I prefer the valley route. I took that picture last week in the valley that I like to walk in. Now, we don't want to live in spiritual valleys, but when it comes to hiking, walking in valleys is always easier than walking up the mountains. But last Thursday, Rachel, my wife, she says to me, she says, down by the ocean, the humpback whales are migrating through. So let's change our route. Let's walk down to the beach to see if there are any whales, and then we'll take a different route, which will take us up one of these mountains, not like really a mountain, but they're like mini mountains, and then circle back to the house. And I'm like, whales? Cool, I'm from Illinois. Right? Let's go look at whales, right? So we go down there, and no whales. So we decide to keep taking the route. And this route, we have to climb up and around it. And we start walking, it seems okay at first, but you know, like within like 20 feet, I'm getting tired. I'm, I like walking in the back. It's easier. So I'm walking, I start puffing, I start sweating. I'm bending over and... And she's like, she looks at me and rolls around. She's like, you want to turn around and walk back? And I'm like, I'm fine. So we keep walking, and I finally figure out that I, that I, you know, I, I shouldn't complain so much. So instead, I, I bluff by saying, oh, I want to stop and take a picture of, of the scene. Because it looks like I really am enjoying it, but it's really my time to rest. And, and, and so, like, every ten feet, I'm like, i got to take another picture. <laughs> and after trucking and sweating, like, at this point, I know I'm going to have to change my clothes when I get home. Because, like, that's how like, damp I am. But I get about halfway up the hill. And I take this picture, and the view, and I'm not even at the top yet. The view is really good. The higher you go, the prettier it becomes. And you, you see, it, I know if you're in the back, that little kind of white, yellowish dot is, is, the, is the house I live in. And you see over the hills, you see just a touch of San Francisco in the Golden Gate Bridge. And you keep walking. And you get to see more and more and more. But I'm only halfway there and this is work. And even though we're trying to circle back to the house on this trail, it starts to get dark. And I didn't bring snacks or water. I thought this was going to be an easy hike. I'm like, this could be bad. And, and I'm like, like, here's the, and I said to her, I'm like, once it gets dark, the coyotes come out. And I'm like, you're going to have to walk in front of me now to protect <laughs> Because I have to go to leadership lab. And I need somebody to protect that. And once again, I got the old emoji eye But the thing is, to walk up and get that perspective, you have to go higher. And it takes work to go up the mountain and see things in a new way. I want to go back to the beginning of the week when Lisa, and Lisa was up here, Lisa talked a little bit about the transfiguration. Jesus, and Peter, and James, and John. He calls his inner circle. He says, let's go up and see things in a new way. And it says in the Gospel of Matthew that they didn't just walk up a hill or a mountain. It says they went up a high mountain. 
That's at work. Not only were there not groomed trails like a national park, they also had probably inadequate footwear. But he wanted to show them a view from above. He wanted to take them to higher ground. And it is in that moment when he gets up there that he is, it says, he is transfigured before them. Which is a weird word, by the way. Totally, like, we use that word like once, maybe twice a year, like transfigured. You don't use it in normal speech. It's not a common word. And I would prefer if they would, we would just use the word that's actually in the Greek, and it's a word you know. Metamorphosis. That's actually what's going on. It's when one thing changes into something else, and that's a strong word. I mean, it's not like Jesus changed from being a human into an angel or something like that. But it is a change nonetheless, that he kind of changes from earthly, regular Jesus into this image of this heavenly, glorious Jesus. He's bright white. And I can't help but thinking about this transformation. Yesterday we heard from, what was his name? It was uh, Commander Chaos. He was a superhero, I, I think. But it's Mike Thomas underneath, or you got Clark Kent, who is Superman, and Diana Prince, who is Wonder Woman, and Bruce Wayne, who is Batman, that there's this change, that there's a secret identity. And then we found out that, that Roy got to become a superhero. You were given a cake, and when you put it on, at first I thought, you are the superhero Count Chocula. <laughs> But that is not true. You said, no, no, no. You had to come up with a superhero name. And you are... You are a silent man. Grace Guardian. But Jesus is like that. It's as if they'd been hanging out with him and it looked like normal rabbi Jesus. But he reveals who he really is. And you want to know why he did it? It wasn't for himself. He wasn't surprised by the transformation. He wasn't surprised from the voice of heaven saying, this is my son. Listen to him. He wasn't surprised by Moses and Elijah showing up. He did it not for himself, but for the disciples were with him to prepare them for what was ahead. That mountaintop experience was meant to sustain them when they were going to be in the valley of the shadow of death and on, on Good Friday and other times of their life that were less than perfect. He did that so that they would be ready for the harder times of life. And these guys did exactly what we want to do today. When they saw Jesus transfigured, when they saw Moses and Elijah, Peter speaks up and he says, hey, Lord, it's really awesome to be here. Um, if you'd like, we'll put up three shelters, three tents, three tabernacles, as if to say, let's just stay here. Right? Isn't that kind of what we're thinking today? Let's just stay here. Let's just make this our permanent location. Right? Amen? Amen? That's right. And so they're fully immersed in the moment like we are. And we say, let's forget everything else. We can invite others to come up here and be with us, but let's just stay. There's no more journey. We have found our destination. And that's what we want to do when, when something good is happening. You just want it to last. You just want to stay. But here's the problem. Even if you could, it wouldn't be the same. Mountaintop experiences, for whatever reason, are always temporary. And they're never very long. And there's a reason for that. God has plans for us down in the valley. The temptation is, let's just stay. Let's keep it to ourselves. Let's keep it special. Let's keep it safe. And after we have an encounter with the Word of God, with God Himself, God says you don't get to hold on to that. God will lead us to places that we wouldn't normally go. 
And that includes caring for others when they're in the valley of their lives because there will be times, and we've shared some of those already, that we have valley moments and we are glad when other people come along inside of us when we're going through it. That's one part of that, is we get the mountains hot so that we can walk in the valley with others. But it's not just those around us that we walk with. There's also another component of this, of being leaders, that we have to speak out when others are being mistreated or hurt. We have to speak out or speak up when other people want to keep people in a valley that they don't want to be in. We have to say, hey, that's not cool. See, and I've watched, and maybe you don't follow, but I've watched in this past year, an increase in the language of hate and an increase in actionable meanness towards people. So the beginning place is not only to care for people you know, but to speak out when other people are forced to be in a valley against their will. It doesn't make any difference what it is because as Christians, when Jesus sees someone being oppressed, he always takes the side of those who are stuck in the valley, always. Whether it is a willingness to strip health care from 22 million people because some people believe that health care is a privilege for those who can afford it, we speak up. saying, because of your, ge your gender identity, you can't serve the United States military. We speak out. <laughs> or, when people are emboldened to use violence against the Islamic community and the LGBTQ community, and we hear our leaders tearing them down, we say, enough is enough. Yet, that we must always stand up and say, hey, there is our system of life that is rigged against a whole group of people because of the color of their skin. We say enough. <laughs> and it is ironic and it is so subtle that white people say, well, it doesn't affect me, so I don't see it. We say, stop talking. the mountaintop in and go into the valley because it is the right thing to do when people are forced to live in a valley that they don't want to live in. If we can't get them out of it, we're certainly going to stand with them. And that's what we call them. <laughs> Speaking out when something is wrong is called protest. And protest can lead to progress and resistance can lead to resolution. So we need to let justice roll down from the mountaintop because we've been here and we are that river and we are that stream and unfortunately we have to go, but we have to go with justice and God who is going to carry us and move us forward. We can't just hang here. We got stuff to do. It's a young man, and the dad is, is at his wit's end. He's like, I don't know what to do, and I heard that you were up there, so I came to the foot of the mountain. I'm in the valley, not only spiritually speaking, but literally. And I went to your disciples and said, can you help? And they couldn't do anything about it. So when Jesus comes, this man says, if you can heal him, will you help us? There's work to be done in the valley. And Jesus says... What do you mean, if I can? Are you kidding me? 
Anything is possible for those who believe. And dad says this. This is what scripture says. Scripture says, the dad says this, I believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Which is really the fancy Bible way of saying, well, kind of. Do you believe I can do anything? Kind of. And Jesus doesn't say, well, that's not enough. Jesus says that's more than enough. And he heals that boy. And for the record, Jesus never denied anyone health care. Amen. <laughs> That when we leave here, there are going to be times when we feel like we're paddling upstream and we're not making any progress. And it, it might seem at times that we're always walking up a hill and we never have the winds at our back. But here's the thing, that the death and resurrection of Jesus shows us the extent of God's love and God's presence in our life. And when we tell that story of Jesus in the church, we begin even before he was born in that time before Christmas called Advent, right? And in Advent, we hear about crazy John the Baptist eating locusts. We hear about him saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And we often, in church, in that month of December and the end of November, we always go back to this guy named Isaiah. And Isaiah is a prophet 700 years before Jesus. And he starts talking about getting ready for this Savior that's going to come. And this is one of the things, and I look at it in a completely different way now that I've been here this week. Isaiah says, 700 years before Jesus, every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain shall be made low. Isaiah knows something that we don't. He says, look, the Savior's going to come, and he's going to change the spiritual landscape. There isn't going to be mountains anymore, and there isn't going to be valleys. He's going to even things out. And you go, well, how can that be? I still have highs, and I still have lows. It doesn't seem like anything has changed. But I will tell you is that when Jesus ascended Mount Calvary, everything changed. He turned that mountaintop into a valley when he died. And on Easter morning, when he came out of that tomb, out of that dark valley of the shadow of death, he turned that valley into a mountaintop when he came out and said, Ta-da! I'm <laughs> And because of that, there is nowhere we can go without his love. It may not be leadership lab, but Christ is with us. And so it is time to lead the way. And I will tell you, you cannot count on Washington, D.C. to lead the way. <laughs> and unfortunately, we can't even trust some church leaders to lead the way. But I trust you to lead the way, and so does Jesus. I trust you. one day, I would love to see all of you working in the church, working side by side with, with other folks who are already in, have had a calling to church vocation, people like Rob and Roy and Matt and Jason and Rayleigh and Chad and Thad and Marissa and Matt and Sue and Natalie and Vanessa and Marcia and Rod and Jane and Waylon and Bob and others. I want to see you guys working in the church with us too. Consider a church vocation. We need you. The world needs you. And I was thinking about a song. Not, not one of our Christian songs. It was a song written by a Motown great. By Marvin Gaye. And when I heard this song and thinking about it, I didn't hear Marvin Gaye and his singers singing it. I heard Jesus singing it to us. <laughs> 